Let's begin today with a prayer. Let's pray. God, as we gather here, we thank you for bringing us this day here in this sanctuary among your people. And we long to hear a word from you in this hour, something we can take with us and apply to our life this week because we seek to be true disciples of Jesus. And so open our eyes and ears and hearts to hear what you have to say to us this day through Christ our Lord. Amen. The best laid plans of mice and men. You've probably heard that saying. It refers to the unpredictability of life. Life is fragile. Things can change in the blink of an eye. But I discovered not long ago that that phrase was originally attributed to the Scottish poet, Robbie Burns. According to the legend, Burns was plowing a field one day on his farm, and he accidentally disrupted a mouse's nest. This was a nest that presumably the mouse needed to survive the winter. And according to the story, Burns composed a poem right on the spot while still holding the plow in his hand. And it included the line, The best laid plans of mice and men go often awry, leaving us with nothing but pain and grief for promised joy. Now, the American writer John Steinbeck used part of that line as a title of perhaps his most famous novel, Of Mice and Men, a story of migrant workers and broken dreams in 1930s America in the Dust Belt back in the 1930s. Well, I think all of us understand the truth behind that saying, the best laid plans of mice and men go often awry. You know how plans can change at a moment's notice. Career plans, family plans, travel plans, they can all go up in smoke. They can all change in a moment. And if COVID taught us nothing, it certainly taught us that. Life is unpredictable. It's fragile. You've probably heard the quote from the director and movie actor Woody Allen who said, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. St. Thomas Aquinas, the medieval theologian, put it another way. He said, humanity proposes, but God disposes. Aquinas left no doubt as to who he felt was in charge, and that was the Lord himself. Or maybe, just maybe, the Rolling Stones are more to your liking. You might remember one of their better-known songs where they sang this line, you can't always get what you want, but if you try, sometimes you might just get what you need. When's the last time you heard the Stones quoted in a sermon? <laughs> it's an interesting thought, though, isn't it, that somehow, somehow, adversity can come out a blessing. When one door closes, another can open. And that's the interesting thing about the best laid plans of mice and men. It works both ways, doesn't it? The unpredictability of life. It can work for good. It can work for evil. Our New Testament lesson for today is a story about plans that go awry. It's a story about the unpredictability of life and how Plans can change at a moment's notice. It's a story in the life of two apostles we know as Paul and Silas. And as it was read for us earlier, it takes place in Acts chapter 16, but the backstory is the previous chapter. Because in the previous chapter, we have that account of the council in Jerusalem where the leaders of the early church gathered to settle once and for all the Gentile question. Because up until that point in time, you had to become Jewish first before you could become a Christian. But after that council, they decided that everyone, regardless of their ethnicity or their country of origin, could become a Christian through faith in Jesus. 
And at that same council, they commission Paul and Silas to be the first missionaries to the Gentile world. And they, they lay hands on them and they send them forth to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Well, Paul and Silas, their first plan is to go to Asia Minor. But the scripture says God prevented them. The Spirit prevents them. And then Paul has this vision of a, a man from Macedonia standing beside him in a dream saying, come over and help us. And so the two apostles change course. They set sail instead for Macedonia and end up landing near the major city of Philippi. It's really amazing, if you think about it, how God will close one door and open another, or maybe a window. God will say no to one thing, but yes to another. St. Columba was a 6th century Irish monk, an abbot, and a missionary. And Columba, it is said, was the first person to bring Christianity to Scotland. But Columba apparently ran afoul of the religious authorities in his native Ireland. He had a big disagreement with them, and he became rather upset and decided he was going to go and found his own order, his own monastery, far away from Ireland, somewhere where he couldn't even see his homeland. And so, along with 12 other monks, they set sail one day from the Irish coast. And about a day later, they landed somewhere, but it wasn't far enough away for Columba because he could still see his native Ireland, the coast, far in the distance. So they set sail again. Next time, they landed on the tiny island of Iona, off the coast of Scotland. And it said that is where they first brought Christianity to that country. It's interesting to consider Columba and his courage in going forth, not really knowing where he was going, but going forth in faith to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And it's a story that happens all throughout the Bible. There are many accounts of the saints doing the same thing. And probably the prototype would have to be Abraham. If you remember the story in Genesis, Abraham is told by God to leave his family, his home, his country, and to travel to a faraway land. And the scripture says, not knowing where he was going, but going forth in faith. Well, today in our scripture lesson, Paul and Silas are doing much the same thing. They are courageous. They are sent forth and commissioned to go take the gospel to the Gentile world, and they end up in Philippi, one of the leading cities of Macedonia. And when they get there, they have to decide where are they going to set up shop, so to speak, to, to preach the gospel. And so they go down to um, a place of business, down near the river in the city, and they notice a group of women who are deep in prayer. They, they are religious women. We really don't know much about their faith. But one of them, her name is Lydia. And we are told she is a businesswoman, a wealthy woman, a dealer in purple goods. Now, it's interesting to see how Luke, who's the writer of Acts, describes wealthy people. In both his gospel and in the book of Acts, there is no middle ground when it comes to wealthy people. In other words, they either fully accept and embrace the message of Jesus and follow him, or they completely reject him. That seems to be the case. Think about the story of the rich young ruler in Luke's gospel. He was close to the kingdom of God, but he just couldn't quite bring himself to divest himself of his wealth because Jesus knew in his case not for everyone, but in his case, his wealth was getting in the way of his relationship with God. And it is said that he walked away very sad. He could not make that decision. But then there are people like Zacchaeus, the tax collector, and Lydia, who fully embrace the message of Jesus and then use all of their resources to spread 
the Word of God. I love the story of Lydia in Acts chapter 16. It's got a powerful message for us today as the followers of Jesus. And Lydia's faith, I believe, is revealed in more than one way, in a number of ways. First of all, we are told that Lydia was a worshiper of God. Verse 14, a certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Thyatira and a dealer in purple cloth. This is the first thing we are told about her. She was seeking God. Now notice the approach of the apostles. Instead of going to the local synagogue, which is where you'd think they would go, they go to where the seekers are. They go beyond the church walls. They're very creative in their thinking, and Lydia is also a progressive thinker. This was a very patriarchal society in those days. Women really couldn't find a place. And so they create this place of prayer down by the river. And Lydia becomes their leader, and Luke gives us some background on her. She's a very wealthy woman, a a successful person, But this does not define her. In some versions of of the Bible, it says the first thing Luke tells us is that she is a worshiper of God. Only after this does he mention her business and her profession. In other words, she was defined not by her work, but by her faith. There's an old saying, Do not go where the path may lead, but go where there is no path and leave a trail. Lydia encourages us to blaze new trails outside the walls of the church into our communities and neighborhoods and beyond. Next, Luke tells us that Lydia was an active listener. Verse 14, the second part of verse 14, it said, The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. It's amazing what listening will do for you. So much of this story in Acts has to do with listening. Listening puts us in tune with God. Paul's trip was planned for Asia Minor, but God closes that door and redirects him, and Paul and Silas listen to the Spirit of God, much like Lydia. Douglas Macmillan was a Scottish preacher of several generations back, and there's a story that one time Macmillan was interviewing a group of teenage boys for membership, and he was interviewing them with some of the elders. And Macmillan wanted to sort of check out the authenticity of their faith, and so this pastor said to them, what changes have taken place in your life that would lead us to believe you have been converted? And one of the teenage boys said, oh, there's been no change in us, The change was in you about six months ago when your preaching got interesting. (laughs) What happened there? Well, you know, God opened their hearts. They were listening to the Spirit. The Methodist preacher John Wesley went through a period of great despair in his own faith. And one morning he was reading a certain scripture and he was looking for direction. And he had that famous experience where he said his heart was strangely warmed. And from that point on, God used him in a mighty and powerful way. In today's scripture, Lydia comes to faith by listening to God's voice and the words of Paul. It is then that Lydia's faith comes to fruition in the generous gift of hospitality. Verse 15 When she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. 
and she prevailed upon us. Notice how Lydia opened her home to these early disciples. Hospitality, my friends, is a real gift. It, it helps make us vulnerable to others. It mirrors the hospitality of Jesus on the cross, giving of himself for us. Lydia didn't just go to church, she became the church. She hosted the church in her home, and we cannot downplay this gift. If you continue reading in this same chapter of Acts 16, you'll read about where Paul and Silas are accosted by this slave girl who has this spirit of divination, and she raises a lot of money for her slave masters. And then Paul becomes kind of annoyed with her and in a good way casts out the demon. Well, her owners are not very happy because now their main source of income is gone and so they call the magistrates and Paul and Silas are thrown into prison and then you have that great episode where the earthquake happens and the walls uh, fall down or the doors open and, and they're freed. But afterwards it says... They go to a home. Whose home? It's the home of Lydia, where other believers were. If there was one place where they felt at home, it was there. Jesus, of course, was the ultimate example of hospitality, wasn't he? As he came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Today, as we take part in the communion experience at the Lord's table, we, in a way, experience the hospitality of God. At this table, God invites us to come freely and without reserve to dine with Christ. We come with joy to experience his love as our gracious host. I believe that Lydia's story invites us to think about the kind of church we want to be here at Kingsway. Lydia's faithfulness and hospitality helped to form a new church in Philippi. It was founded outside the city walls, down by the riverbank. It was a special community to Paul. He wrote of the joy he experienced every time he remembered them, and he talked a lot about that in his epistle to the Philippians. May the Apostles' words be true of our faith community today. Here's what Paul wrote early in his letter to the Philippians. I thank my God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. I am confident of this that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. May it ever be so for us. Let us pray. O oh God, we pray today for the faith and courage of Paul and Silas who went forth to share the gospel around the world. And we think of their first convert, Lydia. She was open to their message and extended to them the gift of hospitality. As we gather around your table this morning, O oh Lord, remind us of the hospitality of Jesus, the one who embraced the stranger and the exile, the poor and the oppressed. May the communion table become a symbol of your love and grace and our calling to extend your love and hospitality to all. May we always follow the example of the one who came not to be served, but to serve, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.